16, we'll do all three verses. Page number 12. A song that we don't do very often, it's fairly new, but at the name of Jesus, we'll sing through it one time, but one day, every time, we'll confess and praise him. Uh, page 28. of every blessing. Let's sing all three verses of page number 11.
love that last verse. Yeah. Um, I have to share with you, it just popped in my head because it's so fit. Uh, I attended a conference the last few days, a type of a training deal, and I got to hear from four teenagers, and they were ages 11 to 15. I've never in my life heard teenagers give testimonies like theirs. And they even talked about that last verse, that as teenagers they wander. But no matter how they wander, God is always there for them. And how God, He pursues us first. He seeks us. And then once He catches us and we turn to Him, then we pursue Him. Because we want to follow Him more. And I'm telling you what, I scrolled all day long. Because you hear kids that young. Whew, that's strong in their faith. It was incredible. So that verse just really hit this morning. And maybe it did y'all too. I don't know. Uh, we sang it for a reason. Don't know why. But maybe it spoke to you as well. But um, that's my prayer for my two. And every child in this church, as teachers and as parents, that's our job is to teach them to love God and that God loves them and when they turn their hearts over to Him that it's their turn to pursue God and to know Him more. And that's what this last song is. Now I'm telling you, whew, the Lord works in mysterious ways. I didn't know I was doing music today until I get here. Now all of a sudden it's all just clicks. So our last song is As the Deer, page 548. As the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs for you. Let's sing all three verses if I'm going to be here. It is Father's Day today, and I want to say thank you for all those that are here and to you that are uh, fathers here today. I want to praise God for you and pray that uh, God be with you and bless you and that uh, He will keep you and guide you in the paths that you are to take. 
Uh, we've been living in a country now for many years that has seen, at least in the media or on TV and uh, Hollywood, or uh, we could even say maybe the secularist crowd, where fatherhood is a uh, has been the butt of a joke for a long time now. And uh, we've given a day to fathers in June, but back in 2000, we've given the whole month to the, the lesbian and gay uh, movement in June of 2000. And then in 2009, uh, the whole month was given to the LGBT movement. So, uh, you know, uh, fatherhood, uh, the world, at least uh, the secular world, has tried to eclipse fatherhood with many things and has tried to place upon fatherhood uh, a type of shame uh, we're seen more as toxic than even nourishing but despite how the world sees fatherhood fatherhood is statistically the most necessary position or job if you would in society today especially when it comes to bringing up moral dutiful courageous righteous children Therefore, husbands and fathers and grandfathers, we are called to be an anchor in a society and in a world that has gone after reality TV. We're called to be an anchor. We're called to be a light in a moment of darkness. And so let's not miss our moment as fathers. Let's not miss our moment to, to stand up uh, to what the world has labeled against us. Let's stand against that. Let's show the world what True men are really like. And what it is to raise godly children, to follow after the Lord Almighty, to give their lives in the service of others, to protect those who are weaker, to strengthen those that are at a moment of weakness, to stand in the gap. That's what we're called to do. That's what men are called to do. I want to talk today about four things that show us how to shine as men, that... that what manhood is really about, if you would. Four things, very basic things that God's Word portrays as uh, must occur in a father or a man's life. The first thing that God's Word teaches, that we as fathers, we must provide that which is needful. We must provide that which is needful. And this comes at a time and in a place where uh, men are seen as expendable. As expendable. But God's Word does not address as expendable. He addresses fathers and mothers as equally important in the raising of a home. But it also presents men as something that back, I think, uh, not even 20 years ago would be self-explanatory. When I say that which is needful, we as men and fathers are called to provide for the needs of our family. And that, that was just taken across the board as, as common knowledge, but now it's seen as a foolish ideology. But the reality is this. Listen carefully. This was written by Live Science, not a Christian magazine, not a, a so just a secular magazine, uh, but about science, and I love science. And it says this reports. It reports that loving mothers actually help their babies develop bigger brains, and uh, they become more capable of learning, memorizing, and responding to stress in their life. You say, what's that have to do with fathers? Mothers. Being with their children from a young age prepares the children to follow their fathers into a work environment in a stressful life. And so if we as fathers do not allow our, our, our wives to be with our children in that crucial time of growth, then they're not going to be able to follow us into an environment that is filled with stress and pressure. Now, do we see that going on today? Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Where, uh, with a couple spoken words, a college student collapses into a pool of tears as they begin to melt to society's pressures. We call them snowflakes. We do. That's what we call them. They were never... Uh, a couple of things were uh, more than likely the problem, and we can see this. We just statistics are starting to bear this out. Uh, they were not raised according to one. I'll just say this: according to the biblical standard, for sure. But they were not raised with a mother at home, and they were not raised with a father who provided 
and then took them alongside and trained them as a father is supposed to do. Fathers, it is our job to provide that which is needful so that our children can grow in the best way possible. You say, John, but there's occasions and instances where we cannot do that. I understand that. I understand that, that there are uh, single mothers out there and things of that nature. By the way, the church is supposed to step up, right? A church is supposed to be filled with godly men and men who have maybe raised their kids and their kids who have gone on. Guess what? The Word of God, according to Titus chapter 2, says, You older men, you're to take the younger ones aside and teach them and train them in the ways that they are to live. So we are all ready to have male mentorship within the church. God has already set it up in that fashion. So if you are here and you're an older man and your kids have grown and they're doing well, hey, consider some of the young ones that have no father, right? Right? That's what we're to be doing. That's what God has called us to do. It's a continual job. Look around in our in our classes on Wednesday. Look around in our schools through the week. There are many hundreds of kids that have no example of how to live and how to cope and how to become a man in this life that we live. But beyond that, there are those situations where we say, uh, John, we just cannot do that. We cannot financially see this through. And, and I hear your cries. I hear your issues. Uh, but is it more of that we think that we cannot do it? Or is it more that we've stretched ourselves so thin where we are now bound up financially not to be able to do it? Right? There's two ways to look at this thing. Well, the Word of God tells us, and I'm just going to be straightforward today, because uh, I'm talking to you men. You just have to take it on the chin. Like, I had to take it on the chin all week. There you go. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8. We know this verse. And you can turn there if you like. But Paul is writing to Timothy. Paul, an older man in the faith, is writing to a younger man in the faith. And he's saying, I want you to make sure and teach this. And make sure that you're teaching this to your congregation. Because the church had become uh, a catch-all. Which is, is what the church is to do. Is to catch those that are slipping through the cracks. That is part of the church's responsibility. That's why we do mission projects where there are shut-ins and there are elderly or widows in this case. Or single uh, 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 parent families where we step in and say, hey, do you need help? We see that you do. Let's help. We don't want anything in return. We're here to help. That is what we are to be about. But at this point, Paul was trying to hedge the church from being overburdened by people who really didn't need help. They said they did, but they really did need the help. And so this is what Paul says to Timothy in First chapter, Timothy chapter 5, verse 8. He says, but if any provide not for his own, his own, talking specifically in the context of family, talking especially within fatherhood, because Paul is addressing Timothy how to deal with the families in his church. He said, and especially for those of his own house. Well, not notice that the context of the passage is not just me with my wife and my children, but me with my father and mother, maybe who have gone older in age, and I am called to then uh, take care of them as well. Do we see that in society today, where when the parents get older, many of the younger the kids that are raised and having their families, they say, we don't care about you anymore. Just go to this place. We, we are taking our eyes off of you. We don't want to help you. Now, there are occasions. Understand, I'm talking in generalities here. There are occasions where it's not you're not physically able to. And I, I talk about, and I, my mind goes to Alzheimer's, and my mind goes to dealing with dementia, where it is such a struggle and a battle of 24-hour uh, care, and, and where you do, do have to have extra help. And I understand that completely. There are, are ways to do that. I understand. It comes from, uh, you're listening to somebody who had my, my great aunt, Alzheimer's, and Alzheimer's is in my family, and Alzheimer's is in my wife's family, and so we see, I understand, okay, but on, in generality, I'm talking generality, speaking here, many just pander off their parents when they can't do a little bit for themselves and need a little extra help. And I, I know how my brothers are myself, we're going to be fighting over our parents, we want them at our house. Because they have done their job, and they've done it well. And so now we want to do our part to take care of them. Because we're out of our love for them. He says, 
If they provide not for his own, especially those of his own house, listen to what he says. This is the part that always gets me in this verse. He says, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Now, I'm not even worried about that worse than an infidel, worse than a, the, a, a person of the world. I'm really more worried about that he hath denied the faith. What is he talking about? He hath denied the faith. What is Paul referring to? He is referring to that he has denied the ability of God to do what God said he would do. He's denied his faith that God, God had made, has made a claim. What was God's claim? God's claim is, is that if you will follow my statutes and my commands and my guidelines, I will provide for that which is necessary. He said if you will make uh, the, the important thing in your life, the eternal things, I'll take care of the temporary things. This is no problem, God says to us. You need to focus on the eternal things. I'll take care of all the rest. And so when he says we've denied the faith, what we're saying, is, is that God, I can't do it your way, it won't work. And we're saying no to God, you can't take care of us like you said. We've denied Him. We've denied Him. So, say, John, where, how exactly does that work? Where does He teach us? If you would, turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11. So, very important because here it is that God teaches the apostles how to pray. You know, how do we pray? How do we, how do we address God? What is it that we do? How do we approach the throne of God and, and make our request before God known? And God begins to teach it. If you remember, as you're turning there, in verse 3 of that prayer, it's the model prayer. God says to us, and, and to the apostles specifically, He says to pray and say, God, give us this day our daily bread, right? So Jesus is making a statement here. He's saying that when we earnestly approach God and ask Him for our needs to be met, that He in His glory, in His power, in His riches, will provide for that which is necessary in our life. But then Jesus goes further in the teaching, and He begins to teach importunity, which is to continually go before the throne, continually lay it down, especially if it doesn't seem like God has given an answer. And that's what He's addressing in the next portion. He says, when God doesn't seem like He's given an answer, keep on praying, because God will give an answer. Now, he goes into something very important where I want us to read in verse 9 through verse number 13. Look at what Jesus continues to teach about prayer and God. And he says, and I say unto you, I'm sorry, starting yet, verse 9, and I say unto you, ask, and it shall be given you, seek, and you shall find, knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Now listen, this is not a genie in the bottle verse, right? That's not what he's talking about in the context of everything. It is asking for that which is needful and what God had desired for us. The reality is, is that so often we say, I can't do it, but we've never asked God to fulfill His part of the deal. We, we haven't done them. Say, so God, just He's not. He, I can't. We can't make it. I've done the adding. I've done the subtracting. I've done the multiplication. I've done the division. I've I've looked at my budget. I've looked at how this is going to work, and it doesn't matter if I ask God because it ain't going to happen. And God says, I've been waiting for you to ask. You haven't even asked. We've denied the faith. Look, look at what it says. If a son, now this is God's reasoning, his rationale. What is God's reasoning for saying what he says? Verse 11 says, If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? Don't answer that. <laughs> yeah. Or if he ask a fish, will he give a, uh, will he for a fish give him a serpent? Now that ain't going to happen. I don't like snakes. Or if he ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If ye, that is us fathers, being evil, and that's the reality of our hearts, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them to ask Him? Now, sticking with the context again, what is that which is most important? Remember, we don't want to miss the most important just because of the urgent, right? We don't miss the most important because the urgent. And we see so many things as urgent, but they're really not necessary. And we've missed the most important thing. God lists the most important thing here possible. He's already dealt with our needs in the model prayer. 
He's already dealt with dealing with uh, people who've wronged us and and how to how to forgive others. And then we've already dealt with our daily needs. We've already dealt with all that. We also dealt with it before in the importunity. I, I need a loaf of bread. I need a loaf of bread. I need a loaf of bread. And, and the friend's going to get up and give bread. God says, I love you more than your best friend. I will give you what's needful. And so when he comes down here, he's saying to the fathers, he's saying, look, if you as a father know how to take care of your own children and you do it so often from the wrong standpoint altogether, because we have a wicked heart, you say, John, what are you talking about? Uh, we'll say, shun, I'll give this to you if you'll just shut up. That, that's wrong, right? That's wrong. We, we often do things out of our own desires, not out of what's best for our children, right? God says, I'll do what's best for you always. And so he says, when you come to me and ask, he says, I will give to you that which is the best, which is the Holy Spirit. Now, that, that goes beyond all that which he's already talked about, which is needful. In our life, our physical life, he says, not only will I give you, in other words, he's saying, not only will I give you what is physically needful, I'll give you that which is eternally most important. Amen. And that's the promise of God. He says, I'll go beyond all the needful of this life and go to that which is ultimately, eternally important. I will guide you in my spirit. This is so, this is so critical because we say, I, I don't know how, what kind of decision to make here. I don't know where I should go at this point in my life. Listen, have you been seeking God which will fill you and guide you in your daily life, in your daily walk? I don't know how to handle this situation with my children. Have you been seeking God which will fill you and guide you in training up your children? I I don't know how to deal with my life. Have you been seeking God? Who wants to see that you and your wife are a perfect peace and happiness in your marriage? The one who can guide you into that. The Holy Spirit that will fill you in that. That will lead you in that. Have you been asking God who has said that He would fill you and guide you in it? So we've missed that. And then we come and we say, Brother John, I think I'm going to walk away from my wife. What? Let me ask you something. How long have you been praying about this? How long have you been serving God faithfully? How long have you been putting that which is most important at the top and stop letting the urgent, silly things of life draw your attention away from that which is most important in life? Yeah. Let's answer these questions. We as fathers, listen, we are called to provide for that which is most needful and we have our Heavenly Father to give us the guidance in it. Not only are we to provide that which is necessary and the needful things, we are to also be bearers of that which is true. Truth. We are to be truth bearers. And we can go to no better place than the Proverbs. The Proverbs, some of the most successful men in this world have studied Proverbs over and over and over again. Why? Because it is Proverbs that lays out specific truths of this world. That's what Proverbs is. Wise sayings for this living in this world. And so why was Proverbs written, right? We know, I hope, I hope we know, Proverbs was written by Solomon to his children. A father to his children. And when he begins it out in chapter 1, he writes it and says, I am the son of a great man. And he says, and I'm the father of children, and I want my children ultimately to be great men. And so these are the ways to become great men and women. These are the truths of life. Notice what he says in chapter 1. He says this, the Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel. And well, David was considered as the greatest of king of Israel, right? A wise man. He says this, why is he writing this? To know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, and judgment, and equal, equity. And so he goes on to give uh, subtly to the simple, to the young man, knowledge and discretion. Good judgment, in other words. A wise man will hear and will increase learning. A man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsel. To understand a proverb, the interpretation, the words of the wise, and the dark sayings. Let's pause just for a minute. What is the purpose of Solomon writing to his children? 
And he said it in there, and I'm, I'm going to break it down just for, very quickly and very concisely. He says, there's, there's a couple things I've written it for. One, I want them to attain unto wisdom one day. You say, well, how do you attain unto wisdom? Because uh, first you have to start off with knowledge. He said to the young man, I want to give knowledge. Right? You have to have a knowledge base, just informational base. This is the age of a knowledge base. This and right here, and this and right here, they're gaining in their knowledge base. This one is supposed to be gaining uh, understanding. Because now he has a base of knowledge, and he has to begin to put that knowledge into a systematic uh, uh, format to get an understanding of how things work in this world. That's understanding. So knowledge is one thing. Many never get past knowledge to an understanding of how things work. Huh? That's why they, go, they, they, don't, they don't make it. They're like, well, I don't know, can't, can't hold this, can't do this. And they, they may be genius, but they, can't, they don't understand. And so understanding, and as they put that understanding together, hopefully in their teenage years, hopefully, they start attaining unto wisdom, which is how to apply an understanding of life in their life so that they can succeed in what they, what they set out to do. They make wise decisions. Wise decisions comes from an understanding of the knowledge that they were given at a young age. And Solomon says, I wrote this to build up their knowledge, their understanding, and their wisdom. And then he goes on beyond that. He says, so they can judge rightly, and they can do justly in all that they do. Right? And so this is what he's saying. Listen to verse, look at verse 8. He says this. I'm sorry. Let's do verse 7. He says, now here's the beginning of it all. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. And that's the truth. Oh, fools, we shut it down. We go, but I don't need that. <laughs> and then we mess up over and over again. That's the school of hard knocks, right? Uh, that would be me. Uh, learn it the hard way. My son, hear the instruction of thy father, and forsake not the law of thy mother, for they shall be an ornament of grace about thy head and chains about thy neck. He's simply saying, he's saying, son, if you'll listen to what your father and mother have taught you from a young age, you are going to make it just fine. And I think back in my mind, and I remember all the things my dad would say. He'd probably say, son, let me tell you how this is going to work. You remember those phrases? Yeah, I said, I, I, he was, son, I know you don't believe this, but let me tell you, you may not think so now, but when you're older, you have a family, you're going to see this is 100% correct. And you know what? He's right. He was right. That's how it worked. And I, and I hope, I hope that... As fathers, we can do the same for our children. We can be bearers of truth. What, what does really work in this life? What is most important? And how can you have a good home and family? He says the fear of the Lord, the caution, the reverence, the understanding of who God is in all things, it's the beginning of this knowledge. And that's what they have to understand first and foremost. But let's carry on. Not only are we to give them truth, we're not only to give them what's needful, we are to be fathers who are to establish that which is spiritual in their life. Establish that which is spiritual in the life of our children. We've got to hurry. So let's jump to Ecclesiastes real quick. It's just very close to where we are. Get past Proverbs. Go to Ecclesiastes. Look at verse chapter 12. What Ecclesiastes. So the first one, Proverbs, is how to live in this world. And Solomon is about to pass away. And he writes Ecclesiastes for his children. So there's two whole books in the Bible that are written from a parent's perspective to their children. Do you understand? Do you see the importance here? Uh, two whole books in the Bible from parents to children. Specifically the father to his sons and daughters. Right? The first one he wrote on how to live in this life. The second one is to realize that which is most important in life, and that's Ecclesiastes. And he goes on not only to talk about life, but to show that the spiritual is greater of greater importance than the physical. In Ecclesiastes 12, verse 1, it says this, Remember now thy Creator in the days of thy youth, 
While the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. Does anybody want to testify today that they've arrived at the years where there's really no pleasure in the next year? You know what I'm saying? Do you understand what I'm saying? In other words, that, that you wake up every day and you hurt. You go, oh, I hurt. <laughs> I almost forgot that for a millisecond. Right? That's what he's talking about. He's saying, when you can do, when you can go, when you, you have the strength to do, find, remember that God is of prime importance because there's going to be a day where you say, I wish I could do. And I've never, and I've said this before, and I'll say it again, I've never sat in a deathbed, and I've sat at too many deathbeds. I've never heard one person say, I wish I've eaten this more. I wish I went on this vacation, or I wish I had done. Never, never. All I've ever heard was, I hope and pray that my children know what's most important. I've heard people say, I hope that my family can make it out, make it to, get, they're broken up. I hope they can get back together. I've heard that. I've heard people say that I, I pray for my son who's lost, or I pray for my daughter who's lost. I hear all these things that are of eternal importance. I've never once sat at best side and somebody said something of physical importance. Never once. Not when they're drawing their last breath. Because all of a sudden, the preeminent importance is life after death. Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. When did he say this? He was in old age and he was about to pass away. Look at verse 13 and 14. He tells us the conclusion of all Ecclesiastes and he says this. Let us conclude. Let us see the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God. Keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Why? For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Fathers, we are to consider that which is spiritual as preeminent for our children. There's lots of examples in God's Word. We can see